Test, test, one, two, there we go. Test, it's not seeing my, uh, oh, there it is. Oops, I shouldn't. Where should I, should I, can I just drag it onto the desktop? Or is there a folder we're putting them in? So, all I have is, So it has this, it has the keynote, and then it has the afternoon announcements. Okay, then let me make sure that I have that available. Maybe I should just open that. It's a very good one. Hey, good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Nikki Mulder. She is a professor at the University of Cape Town and head of the computational biology division there. Before she joined the University of Cape Town, she was a team leader at EBI for bioinformatics resources, including the widely used Interpro. Um, she leads H3A BioNet, a pan-African bioinformatics network that includes 28 institutions in 16 African countries, and they're developing bioinformatics capacity to enable genomic data analysis in Africa. Um, Nikki is on a number of boards, including the ISCB Board of Directors and the Scientific Advisory Board for Elixir, and she's very active in bioinformatics education initiatives. So I have a, uh, a sort of a uh, statement about her that Wynne Hyde, a longtime collaborator, wrote, she's looking really worried. Don't worry. It's nothing bad. So she, uh, Wynne has sent me uh, something praising Nikki and her work. So I'm just going to read what he wrote. Nikki started her career in South Africa by running the training node at Sanbai. It was then that it became clear that she understood Africa and wanted to make it the center of her career. Driving development of global training programs through the World Health Organization and interaction between networks of people, Nikki helped us to annotate for the first time the Glossina sleeping sickness vector genome. 
encouraging folks to come to centers where they could annotate. This culminated in the genome being published in Science. She quickly became adept at helping groups of diverse scientists from all over Africa realize their dream of uniting under one network. At a fateful meeting in Abuja, she helped to put together a plan for a pan-African bioinformatics network made up of scientists from all over the continent. But we needed funding to get the network off the ground, so Nikki and a few others wrote the one compelling proposal to develop the H3Africa, a bio network a truly inclusive, open scientific paradigm. Anyone can join the program, but you must contribute development of bioinformatics in your country, you must demonstrate delivery, and you must be an equal member of the Pan-African Network. With these principles, Nikki led as PI on the NHGRI-funded network a truly heterogeneous team of in investigators to develop best practice bioinformatics across the continent, grounding Africa in the first major human genomics network. Nikki is a humble leader she works to drive consensus among collaborators, a truly African principle she is clearly driven by. And Wynne concludes by saying, Viva Nikki, we are glad that you are someone who puts the good of Africa first. So Wynne, if you're listening somewhere, thank you for those kind words. I was not expecting that. So um, I'm going to be talking about um, how we're building infrastructure for open science, but responsible open science in Africa. And um, this is amid a number of different challenges. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> um, some of the gen generic challenges, which of course most of the audience know about in big, big and open data, uh, in the, particularly in the biomedical sciences. Then I'm going to talk about um, the work that we'll be doing in the context of, of h 3 Bionet, which I have to... Um, mention what Ishtar Africa is because we're part of that network. And then really dividing this into how we're working open in terms of um, workflows, data, and training, and then some additional um, collaborative open projects that we're working on. So I'm going to start by just defining what I mean by the biomedical data. Obviously, life science data is huge. Um, in Ishtar Africa, we're working particularly with uh, groups that have got cohorts of data. So we're not really working in the clinical EHR space um, where the data is sitting in the healthcare sector because that's much more difficult to work with that data. Obviously, there are privacy concerns. So, but we do need to think about that in the future is moving towards that space to integrate that kind of data with the research data. So the data that I'm talking about is mostly uh, clinical data and experimental data that's used from uh, research cohorts, these are big cohorts. Um, as well as the, the omics data that's generated off that. So we're looking at the data, the biospecimens and metadata associated with biospecimens, um, and then also the clinical, the data, clinical data. So I, I, as I said, I don't think I need to, to um, convince you about why it's important to share biomedical data specifically. So all sharing of data obviously enables reproducible science. People can reproduce what you do. They can add value to what you do. They find new questions for the same data. It increases the visibility and um, uh, value of the data. So for the data generators, and I think this is still something that's not recognized by African scientists, is that actually sharing data is good for your career. Not, it's not um, something that you shouldn't be doing because you want to protect your data. Uh, people get to see your data, they get to cite your data, and they get to set up collaborations with you. And uh, so therefore you get an increased publications and citations. But another thing is actually the sample size. So in big genomics projects, um, people tend, especially in Africa where, where funding is scarce, there's very rarely enough funding to do very big sample sizes for GWAS. And so you tend to do smaller sample sizes. So, so really the, the value of, of standardizing and sharing data is then you can um, do meta-analysis across uh, wider cohorts and um, multiple different cohorts. And as I said, new research questions can be asked to the data, and new discoveries can be made. So for example, um, we've just had a discussion about you know, in now engaging with industry. So the researchers are very much into their research base, and they generate fantastic results. But that cannot actually benefit the patients until that's translated into an actual therapeutic or an actual diagnostic. So there's a need to share the data across um, you know, to, to the private sector. And I think that there's a, there's a bit of a barrier to that currently in Africa because of the sort of suspicion of, of companies. 
And then obviously for pathogen outbreak and response, so, so the ability to respond to the Ebola outbreak requires the data gets shared, it gets um, compared to other data from, from neighboring countries to see where, where the uh, strain was transmitted from, how to, how to build vaccines. So it's really important that pathogen data gets shared, but of course there's um, also a barrier to that. It was an accusation in, the, in the, one of the recent Ebola crises that the samples from Africa were stolen by the West. So obviously it increases the value of the data. We need to embrace open science. That is the um, kind of the ethos that everybody's moving towards. And it's actually, it, it is a funder requirement. So um, for many of the projects, you sign a contract to say you're going to share your data and put, put it responsibly in a public repository. And the journal requirements, you cannot actually publish it in a journal, in any major journal these days without having access to the data. But there are limits to sharing health-related data, the obvious ones being clinical data, worrying about privacy, and people are worrying about their data getting in the, in the hands of the medical insurance. And then human genetics data, no matter how much you de-identify the, the label, genomics data, your genome sequence is identifiable. That is you. It is unique to you. So it, it, it's never truly anonymized. And um, particularly in low-middle-income countries, but even in um, some of the indigenous populations in, in Australia and, and the U.S., there's been exploitation, stigmatization um, that's coming out of some of the projects. And so there is that history of that, which is um, kind of causing a bit of a barrier to, to sharing data. Pathogen data, people don't want to share it because they want to have the first dibs on any potential IP that comes out, if the new diagnostics, vaccines. And so they tend to want to hold on to the data and not share it. Um, and the thing about data versus samples, so samples are finite, you collect, you collect DNA, you might have a certain number of aliquots that you can share. Data can be copied as many times as you like and be distributed, it can move, be moved all over the world. It's really hard to track who's using the data, what they're using it for, if they ever delete the data, if they add value to the data, is that ever submitted somewhere and, and cited. So it's very difficult to manage um, data and, and how it's being used. And then very particularly to low middle income countries is, is having the infrastructure and skills to really exploit the data before anybody else gets their hands on it. So kind of um, more technically what's required for sharing data apart from consent from participants, if it's a um, human data, is a robust um, data sharing model. So people just think, I just want to borrow your data, can, I, you know, can we just transfer it? In Africa, well, in other countries where the internet is limited, transferring big data sets is not trivial, but also having a um, mechanism in place to, to know what, what is the data access agreement, who has access to the data, was the, ethic, was the data collected ethically, is the new, the secondary use of that data in line with the original ethics consent? Um, have you set up agreements where if you're going to publish the data, who, who's going to be on the, on the papers? So there's a whole um, set of, of requirements for, for um, responsible and equitable data sharing um, and, and collaborations. But then there's also the infrastructure. So data transfer for you guys probably doesn't seem like a problem. For us, it's, it's a big problem. Is the bigger the data gets, it's really hard to move that data um, quickly. And also human data then has to be encrypted first. So you need double the amount of space to accept the data, unencrypt it, um, and then work with the data. Transfer, I mean, storage and compute is a problem for us. You obviously need data curation, so if you want to share data, you, it actually is quite a, a resource that's required to curate the data and make it valuable enough for other people to use it um, very easily. Uh, technically, if you're going to share the data, yes, you can put it into a public repository, but if you're not doing that, where do you put it? Do you put it on an FTP site? Do you, do you have a, um, some sort of catalog that you can search the data? So how do you actually serve the data? Um, if it is access controlled, have you got authentication and authorization mechanisms in place? You know, what is a recognized research identi identifier? And then once you've got that recognized identifier, have they actually been authorized by an access committee to access that data? And technically, that can be implemented, but you need that um, infrastructure to do that. Otherwise, you need a lot of manual in intervention. And then I'm going to come back to standard, standardization and harmonization, because that's obviously really important for making data valuable. And then um, there's a huge need for training in, in all aspects of, of all of those aspects of data management. So these are so um, that some of those were, were reasonably specific to Africa, but they're gen generic data challenges. You know, everybody needs to worry about capturing, storing, transferring, um, and managing the data. 
But then uh, to make the data really useful, you obviously need to have good um, analysis pipelines, so processing, integrating with the, with the clinical records, visualizing the data, querying the data. So if the, if the clinician is, the, is, the, is your downstream user, they're not gonna be looking at VCF files. They wanna be seeing a nice, beautiful interface where they can see this, this variant means this for my particular um, patient. And then you need data searching and querying tools and need curation of the, of the metadata. So we started off um, in the past with very data poor, information rich. So we were so little data, we could just add so much value to that data. Now we've got too much data and not enough information about that data. So we need these tools to be able to convert the data to information, to knowledge, and then to translation. And that, I think, is the, actually the biggest bottleneck. We don't, we don't have a shortage of data. So for us, there's also a challenge of, of unequal infrastructures. The amount of money that goes into research in, in, in different African countries is, is really low. And as they were aiming for 5% GDP, that's no, no, Botswana's anyone has even come close to that. But also general infrastructure. So this is um, a map of the, 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 the one on the right is the map of where we have red cup instances. Uh, if you look at NGS facilities, there's just this huge gap in Africa um, and in, in many other low middle income countries. There's a huge concentration of these infrastructure, resources, tools, anything you need sitting in the rich countries. So the other major challenge for us is also um, skills. So we have a huge demand for training in anything data related. That's whether it's from data management or data capture and, and data storage and clinical data management to the full on data. Uh, processing, interpretation, um, and analysis. And then, as I said, the data transfer is a problem, and we've had some data sets which um, literally have taken three months to move from one place to another. So the data is generated in the US. It took us three months to move the data because of various, uh, various challenges. So we actually just ship um, hard drives. That's the quickest way we, we can do it now. We've got big and small hard drives, and we courier those around the continent, and that's by far the, the most effective. So um, I've been talking about the, you know, how much data there is, but actually for African data, there's not that much, but African data is really important. Um, it's important both for us as African scientists, but also for the rest of the world. So for us, it's important because Afri Africa has a, a disproportionate um, burden of disease, and yet we have the lowest amounts of, of uh, funding for research on those diseases on the continent. We have to have um, pathogen and in human data to deal with um, surveillance, treatment, outbreak response, um, our human genetics, the African population is extremely diverse with very short um, habitat blocks, so it's really quite different to, to Europeans, and most of, the, most of the work has been done on Europeans. And when you look at um, polygenic risk scores, they cannot be extrapolated from other populations to African populations, it's, it's been demonstrated. And we found in, in a lot of the, the research that's been done that, that variants that are, are found in African populations from GWAS, they might be in the same gene as the one from, from Europeans, but they're totally different variants. So we cannot extrapolate. We've, we've also done analysis of, of um, diverse populations in Africa, and they're running around with huge numbers of pathogenic ClinVar variants. So because that's, be, that's because ClinVar is based on non-African populations predominantly. So there's a lot that can be discovered from African populations that are relevant to, to other populations. Um, we've had population, because the Africans have been exposed to infectious diseases, there's been um, evolution that, that's caused protection against those, but those variants have then caused um, a susceptibility to a new disease. The obvious one is sickle cell disease, where the, where the mutation gives you sickle cell disease, but it protects against malaria. And there are many other examples of that. So, so we've, they've just been different exposures, different, different um, scaffold of the genome, which means that we need to study our own genomes. But it's also important for other populations because there are people of African descent all over the world. Everybody is, in fact, derived from African, of African descent. Um, but people from migration, from slavery, they're presenting at clinics all over the world and need to be treated appropriately. We also have pathogens moving all over the world. So you can't just say the Ebola is a problem of Africa because it is, the cases do come up um, in, in other countries too. So we can uh, address this with, with uh, genomic studies, but there's a serious lack, as I said, of African data. So in, um, in most repositories, it's um, non-European data, non data is sort of less than 10%. It's starting to increase a bit now, but it's still ridiculously underrepresented. Um, Robert presented on 23andMe yesterday, and I think four or five percent of, of the 10 million people in there were of African descent. There's also a lack of African genomics data repositories. If you do a search for, for African data, 
there are some data sets out there, and not a single one is sitting on the African continent. They're all sitting in, in other repositories. Uh, and that is actually, so we once wanted to put some, uh, keep the South African Human Genome Project data in South Africa, and uh, Nature Communications said, no, that's not a recognized repository. It has to be in a public repository, and the only recognized public repositories were the EGA, the DBGAP. So we couldn't have it, if we wanted to publish in Nature, we couldn't have it on, um, in a local African repository. So this is where uh, this new project, uh, well, not so new anymore, it's about seven years old, the Human Hereditary and Health in Africa project started. So it was a brainchild of the African Society for Human Genetics, um, and they came together at one of their meetings in, in Cameroon and decided they needed an African genomics project. Francis Collins was there, he got excited. Mark Walport was there from Wellcome Trust, and he got excited about it, and so they decided to fund it. And uh, they've funded between them up to about 170 million US dollars over the last few years. And the aim of this is to facilitate um, a contemporary-based um, approach to looking at the genetic, genetic and environmental basis for diseases in African populations. It's all African-led, um, and it's relevant to, to African, um, the health of African individuals. There's a strong capacity development component, um, and the aim is also to build collaborative networks. So the consortium is widespread around the continent. There's some key sites and then um, satellite sites, and there are multiple different projects. So there are 48 projects funded. These include collaborative centers, individual projects. There are a number of LC projects looking at ethical, legal, social um, issues. Uh, there are three biorepositories to make sure that the samples are shared. So sam samples will be available for anybody around the world to, to request access for. And then um, a Pan-African Bioinformatics Network, which I'll talk about later. So it's covering a number of different diseases from um, a number of projects around mental health, microbiomes, cardiovascular-related diseases, um, monogenic diseases, and infectious diseases. Collectively, uh, across the projects, there'll be more than 100,000 participants, and um, they'll have genomic data, phenotype data, and, and biospecimens. So the kind of data, so there's this basic um, phenotype data that's associated with each participant and each sample. There's, some of them are doing whole genome sequencing, some of them are doing genotyping. We developed a new um, H3 Africa chip, which is more appropriate for African populations because the existing chips were, were actually, again, designed for non-African populations. And uh, so there's more than 35,000 samples run on that. There's some epi new projects looking at epigenetic and transcriptome data. And then there are a number of projects doing a microbiome sequencing as well. So the DNA for the, each sample is going to a biorepository for sharing. So the ethos of the project is that the data and the biospecimens have to be made available to the rest of the world. Uh, and the, DN, the data from the um, human data is going to EGA and the non-human data is going to ENA. So as a bioinformatics network, our role is to manage all the, the, the data side of, of H3 Africa. So we have, as um, let me say, we have 26 partners, uh, 28 partners in 17 countries. We've got more than 200 members in the consortium. And the aim is to sort of develop this bioinformatics capacity for genomics research on the continent. So we have a number of different um, specific aims. So we, we, although we would love to just do spend more of our time just doing research on really cool African populations, we have to build an informatics infrastructure because we really were starting almost from scratch on the continent in terms of building the infrastructure. Everybody was shipping their samples and getting everybody else around the world to do help with the analysis because that just simply wasn't 10 years ago. That was just not possible on the continent. We've had to develop a data coordinating center. We are the coordinating center for this. And then actually separately, I also um, co-lead with Vicky in the back there, a sickle cell disease data coordinating center. So that's also to manage um, a very specific sickle cell consortium. And we've got to provide informatic support, build the infrastructure, enable translational research. But what we're trying to do in h 3 it is push this to be an open form of collaboration and support. So our activities are, are centered around the, the, the ecosystem of, of a research project. You get clinical data. We have, to, we have REDCap to manage clinical data. We then um, help them standardize the data. We help them when they've generated their, their uh, genomics data. We help them move it to where they want to analyze it. We provide the tools and pipelines for them to analyze their data. We then have a way for them to submit the data to us to prepare it for submission to the public repositories. And then there's a big training component. So we need to address all the data and bioinformatics needs um, in this project. So one thing I'm not gonna talk about is some of the tools that we've also developed, we're working on. So where the tools exist, we're benchmarking and, and working um, 
see which tools are most appropriate for specific for the for the uh, idiosyncrasies of African data of African populations. Uh, but we're also developing new tools. So we're developing an African reference graph, uh, so the graph genome instead of the, the normal, because the, the, current Afri the current reference genome is obviously, once again, not African-based. Um, so there was a paper recently on, the pan, on a pan-African genome, and you can see how many pieces of African genomes are not represented in the, in the current reference. So we need to start actually starting from scratch and building those tools for um, improving how we can analyze genomics data for African populations. We're also building tools. We've got a simulation framework to, to benchmark tools that's simulating NGS and GWAS data and also microbiome data, post-GWAS analysis tools. GWAS tools for, for complex African data with complex um, collections of phenotypes. So kind of overall, the, the tools that the, the infrastructure and support we need to provide is we need to, we have to, as I say, start from scratch with building the computing infrastructure, managing data uh, itself, uh, the tools and workflows, and storage and submission to public repositories, and then training. And as I said, the whole ethos here is to enable and encourage responsible sharing and open science. So when I'm talking about responsible sharing, I just need to talk a little bit about the ethics side of things. So, there, so some of the, the, the challenges on the more social side of, of sharing data in Africa is we've had the history of vulnerable populations. We have the history of what we call helicopter science, there are different names for it, uh, science tourism, whatever you'd like to call it, where people fly in, grab samples, fly out, and then there might be a token African author on the publication if you're lucky. But even when the, when the African um, collaborator is, is involved in, in the sample collection, because the data moves off the continent, gets analyzed off the continent, the senior authorship is, tends to be off the continent. So it's losing that, that ownership of, of your own data, and, and you know the African scientists are very um, suspicious of that now. We have limited resources to explore the data first and fast. So the, when you get NIH funding, you have to put the data into a public repository. If you haven't had time to analyze and publish your own data yet, you're very reluctant to do that and be you know, all open and, and happy and work with other people, because you haven't had time to actually get your own publications off that data. So as I said, although data is anonymized, there's a risk of, of identification. And we've also had to deal with, uh, the consortiums had to deal with very different levels of, of um, ethics consent in terms of what are, what are the national guidelines for, for ethics consent. So there we've got an ethics uh, and regulatory working group in the consortium. And from the first round of projects, we, were, we had five years of funding and now we've got uh, another five years. They, were, they did an analysis um, of, the, of guidelines from 22 different countries, and some, there are only some countries that have actual specific, that had at that time, anything legislative about genomics data, because it was, it was never really a big thing, so it was never actually in, uh, in the national kind of the policies. Broad consent um, is prohibited in some countries at the moment. Uh, some countries neither prevent or, or promote it and other countries allow um, use of data for, for future use, but under certain conditions, like you have to go back to the national ethics boards. So they um, they basically came together, they, they've had ethics consultation meetings, so bringing together the national and, and institutional ethics boards to educate them on genomics research and the value of open sharing and, 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 and data sharing and secondary use of data to try and, um, and actually it has led to some national policy changes over the years. And so they've developed this sort of model for, for, um, for a framework for, for responsible sharing and, and use of genomic, genomic data and biobanking. So also taking this into account, the um, Asia Africa Data Sharing Access and Release Policy was developed to enable, to ensure that the data goes public and gets shared and everything gets, is open but taking into account the fact that we didn't have as many resources, so there's a longer timeline for being able to submit your data to public repositories. So the aim of this is to protect the participants, but not being a barrier to science, to recognize the contributions of the researchers, uh, promote the, the, the de deposition of data, um, and ensure sec it's responsible secondary use of data. And they're also trying to encourage collaboration with African researchers when you ask for access to the data. So our role for this, as I said, has been having to do everything from scratch, building the computing infrastructure, building containerized workflows, providing support um, and skills. So I'll go through some of these in a bit more detail. So starting with the um, computing and infrastructure, so I'll come back to the node accreditation and workflows, but we've also had to um, worry about the huge problem of, of bandwidth. 
So um, internet is a huge challenge in terms of both moving data, accessing the cloud. Everybody says, oh, we've got our, our, our um, workflows on the cloud. Well, you've got to move your data to the cloud. You've got to access the, the, the cloud. And that's a challenge for, for, for many African researchers. So we, what we did was we actually did a re, we do real-time tests of the network speeds between different countries. So we've got iPerf client running at different nodes, and we do regular tests of moving data between all our nodes, and we test that. And it's never, ever close to what the university or the institution says that, says that their speeds actually are because of firewalls and, and all sorts of, and then all the students using the network. So um, we're actually working now with the NRENs, all the people who are actually laying the cables and, and, and managing the internet infrastructure to try and have some dedicated lines for research. And the computing infrastructure, we put in computers in various different places, but then we also had to train the sysadmins in how to, how to manage um, bioinformatics applications. Because bioinformatics, if, you, if you've ever worked with an HPC, our HPC works with um, the astronomers, who are so easy, they run one nice piece of software which never breaks, and they just keep running that. Bioinformaticians come with 20 pieces of software for one workflow and say, I need all of these. Oh, and there, there are um, libraries that I need for this, and they, you know, all sorts of dependencies, and they just, and then the next day you come and say, oh, but it's been updated. Can we do that again? And they, uh, and they freak out. So, um, so we've had to actually get sysadmins at these centers trained in bioinformatics applications. And, um, and then once we've done that, then we try to get these workflows running. Now, one of the things we have to do is we have to say, we are a bioinformatics network. We, we need to provide support for a specific workflow. But how do we know? So I'm sitting in Cape Town running this network thinking, what if somebody goes to my Nigerian node and actually the Nigerian node doesn't really know how to do GWAS? So we started what's this called um, a node accreditation exercise. So this was actually constituted by Victor, who's in the audience. And the aim of this was to assess the ability to carry out a workflow properly. Um, and I'm, not, I'm sure most people actually never actually assess this. So you say you can do something, but have you proven it? So what we do here is we have a standard set of standard operating procedures for a workflow. We've chosen workflows that are relevant to Asia Africa. We have a practice data sets so people can go and practice on them. We um, tell them what compute they need. Then we, if somebody says they practice, and then they come and say, right, I'm ready to, to undertake the accreditation exercise. We then give them a, a, a data set, which is not published, so they can't look it up anywhere. They have, um, I think it's four to six weeks to complete that and send a report of exactly, so we ask specific questions about that. They send it to report. We've got an independent um, review board that looks at it and say, it comes back and says, based on this report, I'm confident convinced that this group knows how to do GWAS, for example. So we've done this, um, uh, in, in doing this, we then set up all these SOPs where we have information about, we've got practice data sets, what compute requ requirements you need. So we've got this for um, whole genome sequence and, and variant calling, 16S GWAS, uh, SNP imputation, and we we're busy creating one for RNA-seq. Started off slowly, now loads of our nodes are hopping on board, and, and it's amazing that they use it as a capacity development exercise, because they tr train themselves, and then they run the analysis, and then we're confident that they know, they're credited to, to run this um, tool. So the other thing we decided to do, sort of as a, as a follow-on to this, was to actually develop the workflows ourselves, so that um, they could be used and reused. So um, we decided we had to make a decision on, on which workflow language to use. So there was Nextflow versus uh, CWL. We chose both because we had expertise in, in Nextflow, and then we had Michael Cruzo coming over and giving us his expertise in CWL. We decided on a containerization technology. We got Brian to come over and uh, work with us because he's been working with Docker. The tool, the, the workflows we decided to use were based on what kind of Asia Africa data there was going to be. So those are the four, four workflows that I mentioned before. Um, and we also needed to, to work out, we have got heterogeneous um, compute environments. We wanted to work it on, on those. So some worked on, on single, uh, were able to be deployed on a single machine, some on HPCs. There was one on AWS and one on Azure. So we had a hackathon for these four different work streams. So we each, we, we brought together people with a big range of different skills. Um, and put them in a room for five days, and they came out with um, some amazing workflows. So this is an example of the output. So each of these workflows shows you all the different steps. It's either using CWL or Nextflow, um, and it can be deployed on a specific uh, compute environment. And then the other groups would then test the, test the workflow um, for them. 
So these are the four workflows. They're all available on, um, on GitHub, but also on, on Quire.io and on, on Docstore. And so anybody can take them and use them. So we've published two papers on that, one just on how to run hackathons, but then one on these actual workflows. And um, the imputation one is being used. We run an imputation service. So we want, the, we've got an African reference panel. The data is an EGA, so it can't be completely public, but we want everybody else to be able to make use of that. So we run an imputation service if you want to run uh, impute array data on, on African, our African reference panel. So another output is that we ran a GWAS course, and now these workflows, so for example, two of the workflows were used in this course. Um, and so we can get everyone to the course, they can run the workflow, but when they go back again to their own institution, they can take that workflow and, 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 and continue to do the analysis. So we, we think that the project was reasonably fair, the, the, the workflows are findable and they, they're accessible. We try to use standards and, and common languages where possible, um, and there's information there about this documentation on how to use it and um, licensing information. So we also tried to work within the FAIR principles um, kind of all, in all aspects of this, uh, of the edge traffic project. We try to make sure all our materials, data, and tools are, are open, they're indexed somewhere, they're available, anybody can use them, they're well documented. Um, it's, it should be searchable, obviously, so we have a, a catalog. We try to use stable identifiers where possible, and we try to put um, access information, license information. But all of this has to be done within the framework of the H traffic data sharing access and release policy. So according to that policy, the, day, the researchers have um, nine months, once the data is QC'd, they've got nine months to submit it to EGA. So it's nine months to get the analysis done and then a further 12 month publication embargo. So in order for the funders to be able to record that nine months and say, well, how do we know when the time, when the clock is up and to make sure the data actually does go out into the public domain, They've asked us to set up a kind of a, a local edge to Africa archive. So we did this, and actually this is kind of the beginnings of what, what EGA is starting to call the local EGA, because we built a system on top of the, of the architecture that they had at, e, at it, uh, EBI for the EGA. So they have a landing area where the data comes in encrypted. Then the data gets moved to um, what we call a vault, which is completely secure. Uh, there's no network access on that. Only one person has access to that. Unencrypted, validated, uh, mapped to ontologies. People work on that. Then it gets re-encrypted and goes to cold storage. And then when the nine months is up, we then take the data back out again. We put it in XML format, all the, all the right formats for EGA, um, and submit it to the EGA. So we are the kind of the liaison officer for EGA so that 35 PIs don't need to, to work with them. We work directly with EGA um, on that data transfer. We can make sure that the data is standardized, harmonized, and it all looks the same when it goes to EGA. So we also have a dashboard so that the funders can track at any point in time which data sets are in there, what progress there is, when they're due to be submitted to, to the EGA. So we currently have 14 data sets in there. Um, eight have been QC'd and submitted to the EGA. Um, and it's about 77 terabytes that are in the EGA, about 130 terabytes at, at our place. The idea is, um, I mean, we, we know that the data is there, so if, if, if this disappears tomorrow, it doesn't matter, but um, there is EGAs interested in having more local EGAs, especially where data cannot actually move across borders, country borders. So then in order to make the data more valuable in EGA, we're doing a lot of work on um, standardizing and harmonizing the data, so all the data is being collected from many different projects, all of which started with their own case report, case report form, asking the, maybe asking the same questions, but asking those questions in a different way, collecting phenotype and clinical data. So we've been working with, there's a phenotype harmonization working group that's working to, 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 to do things. One is to create minimum standards. So this is, if you're going forward with a new project, these are the things you should collect, but also how you should collect that. So what questions should you ask? What is the variable that the, that the, that the data comes back in? And the second thing is, given that the projects had already started when we started, is retrospectively uh, harmonizing data. So going back and say, we are two questions equivalent, we are two pieces of data equivalent. If one is collecting it in a number, one is collecting it in free text, how do you, you know, what, what algorithms can you use to convert them into a um, kind of a minimum standard that, that, is rec that can be computed on across multiple different cohorts? So we're using various measures like Phoenix measures, ontologies, and the, and the GA4GH standards. <coughs> so we, we have this um, core set of phenotypes which all projects should collect, 
And then we're de de defining sort of minimum um, phenotypes that uh, specific projects like infectious diseases, mental diseases, um, environmental, et cetera, should collect. And we've actually got uh, red cap data dictionaries for these and standard CRFs, so people can just download the, data, the, the, the um, XML or the, or the data dictionary, create a CRF and red cap, add to it, modify it, and these are all available on our website. So these are being used for us to be able to serve the data. So one thing about making data, making data findable, um, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is that you've got to find it somewhere. And <clears throat> um, as much as I've worked very well with EGA, finding data in EGA is actually quite difficult. The search interface is, is, is not hugely intuitive. So we've built a, a catalog, so we're making sure that all the data is anna uh, annotated to ontologies. We've created some of our own, like the sickle cell disease ontology. Um, curators are, are here. And um, we're making sure that this data is now searchable. So all the metadata associated with all the biospecimens in the, in the biorepositories and all the genomic and, and clinical data, the metadata is searchable via this catalog. So then the public can go and search the catalog to say, I'm interested in samples from Uganda that have diabetes or cases or controls and they have genomic data, you can search that and then you can automatically fill in a, an access request form. It, it populates the EGA accession number or the biorepository that the samples are sitting in. So in that way, we're trying to make everything fair. So by having the, um, all the data in the EGA, by having this catalog, by standardizing, having the, the links to ontologies. The EGA will be our, st our stable identifiers. Data and red cap are standardized, so the clinical data that comes in um, and all the access to the data, so it's, it's all being uh, controlled by a data, sh a data and biospecimen access committee. Um, and all the access information is, is should be available. So I just want to find, uh, kind of move on now to, those are all the things we have to do, but now we also have to train people in all aspects of data um, in terms of management, analysis, standardization, and sharing. And it's really hard to convince people to share their data, their tools, uh, when you're working in an environment that's, that's traditionally been exploited. So um, we have to have a number of different training approaches. We have face-to-face -face courses. We train trainers to build up more because we have such a huge demand for, for data bioinformatics-related training. We're trying to build new trainers. Um, we have run internships, and we do live online training, and more, more frequently now we're doing running hackathons and jambor data jamborees. So our face-to-face -face training, we've run more than 30 different courses, um, trained several thousand, well, over 1,000 people through those. For train the trainer, we're building trainers in NGS, GWAS, um, and the Carpentry. So we're working with the Carpentries project to have data and um, software carpentry trainers. We placed interns, so that's where you take your data and you go sit with one of our nodes and you actually analyze your data for two months. But the, the <coughs> biggest thing we've had to deal with um, <coughs> is uh, this huge demand. So we've moved more to live online training. So this is not just, okay, here's some lectures, download them and use them. This is um, kind of a, a mixed mode where, where we have real classrooms around Africa, but then everybody signing up live. So we have three different kinds of, we started with our introduction to bioinformatics training course. Our last iteration had 700 participants from about 30 classrooms around the continent, ran for three months. We do, uh, we're starting now, uh, our next thing, which is an intermediate one, where we actually have to have workflows. So we have to have sysadmins at each of these remote classrooms being able to, to manage the running of these workflows. <clears throat> We've run a genomic medicine one um, for a couple of years now as well, that's for nurses. So the mode of this course is that um, you basically have a, a, a classroom in multiple different places. The lecturers pre-record their lectures, and then they've got days to download the lectures because, for example, now at the moment, we've been running the genomic medicine course in Sudan because of the problems in Sudan. They've shut down the internet entirely. So <clears throat> we're actually now shipping the lectures to Sudan on hard drives, although they're getting anything into the country at all is hard. But we're trying to get the lectures in there so that they can still sit in their local classroom if they're, for the other classrooms, if they have internet problems, they downloaded a few days before. They run the lecture at a certain time, it's twice a week, for the same time for every classroom. Then the lecturer goes online, answers questions, and for those classrooms that don't have internet, they're now doing it for the classrooms, are via, the questions are coming via WhatsApp. And then the lecturer can live respond to them, and then they're kind of part of this community. So they're all live at the same time. So this is 700 participants across the continent, all live learning at the same time. And we have various platforms for, for enabling that. So we've got an online classroom platform, um, <clears throat> and then a course management system. 
So that's big one, one big way that we've managed to reach many classrooms. So we've had uh, three years of this. We've had between 27 and 30 classrooms um, over the years. The last course had 700 participants with more than 130 volunteers. So we have teaching assistants in every class. And it's a way to, to make it more open, more available. Um, and all the resources are, are, are open access. They're all, all the lectures, all the videos are on YouTube. We've got a YouTube channel. Every course we do now, all the lectures go on, onto YouTube. So as I said, we're also moving to hackathons. So these are real goal-orientated um, events where you either develop a workflow, you develop software, or you take a data set and analyze the data set. And um, that's helped to kind of let skills move across different, um, different people, but also to have a real outcome like a publication or a tool or a workflow. So overall, um, yeah, the, the, the live online training, we've reached more than 2,000 people. Um, so I think overall we've probably trained um, about 2,500 people, given there's some overlap between those. So our training, we try to make our training as open and fair as possible, so that it's accessible to as, as many people as we can make it accessible to. We haven't moved too much off the continent, because then you worry about time zones when you're trying to have um, live classrooms. We use bio, we're using bioschemas, so we've been working with the bioschemas group to, to build the bioschemas for training um, courses and materials. Uh, we're mapping our training materials to the EDAM ontology so that they're easily searchable in various catalogs. Uh, the bioscheme is just to make sure that they're sloped up by uh, resources like TESS. And the training materials are all available on YouTube or from our website. And then just finally in the last few minutes, just um, talking about some of our other kind of open science activities. Um, so this is talking about open science but also collaborative research. So in... Um, Last, last year, in one of our conferences, we, um, in the last SBCB conference in Uganda, we had this open science cafe. So basically, we get people together, you talk about open science, they have these little cards, and then they put sticky notes all over the place. And it's to promote working open. Um, and it's, it's amazing. It's something that's really, really needed among the African researchers who are not used to that way of working. And so we did it also more recently, uh, towards the end of last year, at International Codata, International Data Week in Botswana. Um, which also went down very well. What we're planning to do with our next iteration of this large bioinformatics open training course is every classroom to encourage them to start an open science group. Um, and the idea then is that in their institution, they then have regular open science cafes and, and work openly. So we also recently ran an East African open science tour. So we teamed up with um, Mozilla and Sage Bio Networks, and we sent people to some trainers to four different uh, East African countries. And we did some training on research workflows and reproducibility, data sharing, code sharing, data management and FAIR, collaborative research, responsible openness and the ethical side of things, tools and platforms to enable open science and collaborative research. So it was really kind of everything about open. Um, so it was a mixture of biologists and computer scientists and, and bioinformaticians that came. So these are just some photographs from the, from the four different courses. And then finally, they, um, another kind of open collaborative project that we've been working on um, was the Dream of Malaria Challenge. So this is where we also want to train people through actually doing an analysis or actually doing some, some work. So for those who don't know what Dream is, it's the Dialogue for Reverse Engineering Assessments and Methods. So basically, people will put some data or a, or a problem out there on the Dream website. It's often sponsored by um, companies or by journals. So Nature will say, whoever wins this Dream Challenge, we will publish that paper in Nature or, or Science or, or some of the other top journals. So it's a crowdsourcing um, challenge to answer a question, to design a tool, to, to analyze data, develop an algorithm. So we um, were approached by a group in, so we were working with, with um, IBM Research, who's just started up in Johannesburg, and they were working with a group in um, Notre Dame University who had a data set. So the idea was to, to um, bring all this together. So for the first time ever, instead of the data going from Africa off the continent, the data went from off the continent onto the continent. So the samples were collected in, in East Asia. The data <clears throat> was generated in the US, and then it came to Africa to be analyzed to prepare it for a dream challenge. So we ran a hackathon. Um, to prepare the data, so we got a mixture of people from uh, biostats, biology, malaria experts, data scientists, to prepare the data, um, do sort of a, a preliminary analysis. That's all looking at trans transcriptome data, looking at um, drug resistance and the, the profile associated with 
single and multiple drug resistance. Uh, it was run at IBM Research. And um, so that's already, and the, and the dream challenge is open. So it's um, the, the aim is to, is to basically build algorithms to analyze, to, to be able to predict um, drug resistance in this, in this data set from the transcriptome data. So I think that closes in uh, the beginning of August. So just to summarize then, um, we having to do a lot of work in getting African scientists to, to, to embrace open science, open data, open tools, open working. We've had to um, overcome challenges of, of sharing health-related data, and there are some ones that simply can't be overcome. There's ethical challenges, there's technical challenges, we have infrastructural challenges. But we've managed to, to, to try and, you know, we do, do what we can with it, pooling our resources and doing what we can with them to enable responsible, equitable sharing of data and, and tools. And through this, we've built a lot of compute. This looks like very small compute to you, but when you have limited resources and you start with nothing, then it ends up being quite a lot. We've got a lot of data now on the continent. We've got tools, and every we've, we've now got a software best practices group so that all the tools that are developed within the group uh, comply with these software best practices um, and that they're fully out there, they're fully open. And then we have this extensive training program to, to enable everybody to, to adapt, ad adopt all these principles. So ongoing work, we, uh, the H3 Africa has just become a driver project for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which is developing a whole lot of standards for, for uh, um, open data in, in the health sector. We um, are partner in Seneca, which is a common infrastructure for national cohorts in Europe, Canada, and Africa, and this is looking at federated data sharing, so building um, tools to enable the compute to move, move to the data, but responsibly, so you have AI in, involved in that um, in terms of authentication. Um, and then we also, the African Open Science Platform has asked us to be a pilot project, um, so they having a meeting soon in, in Egypt to, to um, kind of announce this. But the idea is to, again, promote open science in Africa by building the computing and the networks so all the NRENs are involved in that, the national um, research networks. Provide, produce, um, encouraging good practice and fair data, um, building tools, uh, skills in data analytics and AI. So they're actually gonna try and develop a virtual um, data science institute. So with that, I'd just like to thank the consortium. There are many people, as I said, there are 200 members, but there's some key members who, who run our, our work packages um, and the team at, at, um, at UCT that have a fantastic team there. And to all the, all the coders and the developers and the trainers out there who, who um, help us to promote um, open, open working, and of course the funder, NH. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, just a reminder that we are taking questions online on slide.do. Put it in the code BOSC2019. You don't need to sign up or sign in. Um, and you can also come up to the microphone over here if you'd like to ask questions live. So there are three questions that uh, have appeared already on Slido, so I will read those and let Nikki answer them. In the meantime, if anyone uh, here in the room would like to come up to the mic to ask questions. Uh, the first one, asked by Michael Hoyer, says, in addition to work on reference graph assembly, are there plans to capture and report population-specific MHC slash KIR haplotype and HLA allele sequences? Yeah, so actually when we're doing the reference graph, the first um, chromosome we're working on is chromosome 6, and that's specifically to look at the MHC region. So in designing the H. Africa chip, we look very much in that region to see um, what were existing um, MHC region SNPs that are on other arrays, and then filled in the gaps with ones that we're seeing and specifically on our African populations. Um, but we're having to, because of obviously the variability in that region, and, and Africans having even more variability, we... Um, having to do de novo assembly to, to do that part of the reference graph. So we are very much, that is in fact the first region we're focusing on for, for the reference graph. Thanks, let me do one, one more. I'll do one more from Slido and then we'll have a, a real live person. Uh, so someone asked, can you give more examples of exploitation regarding genomic data sets? So I think the, the exploitations mostly, so from what we see is that um, whenever now I see an, a, a publication on, on African data, I look at the author list. 
And um, so somebody, I haven't put the slides here, but somebody actually did an analysis of publications coming out of Africa. It, the publication came out about uh, maybe five years ago, looking at how many publications on African data have African scientists. And I think it was something like 80% of the papers did not have an African scientist in any leading position, and this is entirely on African data. So, um, so the exploitation is both with coming, taking samples, and doing the analysis of the continent to having a token. So it's not an equitable relationship. I think that's the main thing, is that, is that, the, that, the, that the, the African researchers have been regarded simply as sample collectors and not an equal scientific contributor. Um, but then there's also the case where um, they haven't, the, the researchers have come in and not engaged properly with the ethics boards. And like, for example, there's certain indigenous communities where you actually have to go to the community leader. And the re African researchers have spent a huge amount of time engaging to make sure it's done properly. And then other people run in and just go straight to the, you know, without going through the community leaders. There's a very specific way you should do things. And that kind of exploitation has happened. But as you can just see it by publications on African data. Okay, this is actually not a question, but a shameless plug. Um, this is Victor, who does our short. node accreditation uh, exercise. <laughs> so, um, Nikki mentioned the node accreditation exercise, where we're really trying to build capacity, and we really need reviewers willing to look at the reports and assess them on a technical and scientific basis. And I have a room full of people with expertise in this area, if you want to participate, please contact Chris Fields, who is coordinating this particular effort. Thank you. Okay, we have another question from Slido. Is there a sense of how Africa compares with other developing world regions, such as India, East Asia, minus Japan, South America, et cetera? In terms of infrastructure, <clears throat> um, we didn't say in terms of what, so. Yeah, so I think we're probably more comparable to some of the South American countries. Um, I'm not really sure what the situation is like in India, um, but I know in some of those countries, at least the government has come forward for, for some national efforts in terms of genome sequencing. So I know in India there are actually a few um, genome sequencing national, I don't know if they're quite national, but they're genome sequencing projects. Latin America, there's the um, Latin Gen. So, so some of them are a bit more advanced, I think. I think what we're trying to see in Africa, a lot of people think, oh, Africa, the country. Africa is 54 countries with 54 different governments, all of which have different amounts of money, different ideas. And so, you know, we, we're trying to work across actually very, you know, many different countries. And as, as I say, everyone thinks of Africa as just a country, <laughs> but it's many different countries. And so it's very different in different countries. So South Africa is quite well advanced in terms of infrastructure, training, Whereas there's some other countries where we don't even have a node because they just don't even, can't even think about bioinformatics. They're so busy worrying about just survival and wars and you know, civil wars and all sorts of other things. So it's hard to know exactly because you'd have to compare each country against every other country. Great, thanks. Here's another question. Can you comment on field studies taking place on the African continent, i.e. real-time outbreak sequencing? I think they mean EG. So, yeah, there's a lot of activity in that area now. So um, one of the Edge Traffic APIs is based in Redeemers University in, in Nigeria, and he was very involved in the first Ebola outbreak to curb that in, in Nigeria. Um, so now then the Gates have helped to fund um, an African CDC, and the African CDC is now helping to implement um, more frequent surveillance and genome sequencing. So as part of the Edge Traffic project, actually, um, the the Redeemers University got some NGS sequencing, and Gates has also put some more sequences in in various kind of high-risk um, places. They're still building the capacity. <clears throat> so those projects were already funded um, about three months ago, so they're starting to build that capacity. But there is a lot of surveillance, so um, almost every country has the surveillance of some of their diseases. Um, obviously, when they're in somewhere where there's war-torn war areas, it's harder to, to maintain surveillance, but it's re reasonably active, and it's becoming even more active now with, with new facilities coming in to manage that. Thanks. Um, so, let's see. As well as reducing time and travel for instructors, were there benefits of running such large-scale simultaneous training workshops, e.g., from connecting learners? Yep. 
So it's hard to know because I don't know who to talk to. When somebody, you know, when someone's asked a question, so I can talk to them. So the, um, the, we've had a number of benefits. So obviously, there's some disadvantages to running this because you don't have that, um, you know, everybody knowing each other. But what we do is that um, each, at least in each classroom, they interact with the people around them. They get to know the people. But then also we'll have these like, oh, let's have webcam fun, fun, and then people will light up their webcams and everyone will wave to each other. And what's great is in the, in the offline platform where people put in their assessments, they, um, they do kind of other questions, is that there's a discussion forum. And while the discussion forum is primarily for you to ask the trainer a question, actually all the other participants from other courses. So when you go into the discussion forum after the first week, it's, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm from Sudan. Hi, I'm, you know, I do this. So everybody introduces it themselves to each other online, and then they wave to each other. So it actually does build a community, even though these people are in different places. They're in the same boat, they've got the same worries, they've got the same exercises to do, they've got the same questions, and they actually start communicating with each other um, and answering the questions. And then when they do see each other somewhere, then they, they know the name, they might not have seen the face, but it definitely, though it's not the same as having everybody in the same room for three months, it definitely still helps to build a community while enabling us to reach hundreds of people at the same time. Okay, our next session is on open data, very uh, relevant to the last talk, and it will be chaired by Bastian Grishak-Savoras.